So Team USA was by far the favorite to win this year's World Cup, but they have officially been eliminated and finished in just 4th place. Their first loss was to Dennis Schroeder in Germany, who went on to win the entire thing. But to make it even worse, a few players were out in the final game, so they lost to Canada giving them the 3rd place spot. Yeah, Canada. The team that has never placed higher than 7th and came in 21st place in the last World Cup. They beat Team USA in overtime, and Dylan Brooks absolutely torched them with 39 points. And it really shouldn't have even gone into overtime, that shot Mikkel Bridges hit to tie the game was unreal. He missed the second free throw attempt on purpose, got his own rebound, and shot a crazy contested corner three. I was watching the game live and couldn't believe what I just witnessed. I also thought with the momentum of hitting one of the craziest shots ever, there's no way they lose this game in overtime. Well, they got smacked in overtime and had to watch Team Canada win a medal for the first time ever. I cut Team USA some slack in the game against Germany, mainly because Germany played the perfect game and Team USA really isn't that big of a team. Some of these European teams literally have like 8 centers in rotation, while for Team USA it's mostly just Jaron Jackson Jr. They didn't give Kessler Walker nearly as many minutes as he sometimes deserved, and those two were not enough to carry the load in the paint. Other players tried to make an impact, but it just wasn't enough. Jaron Jackson played really good at the beginning, but as the games went on, he was getting less and less rebounds and blocks. And if you're not defending and rebounding in the paint playing FIBA, then you're just not gonna win. Every other team is packing the paint with a roster of 5 centers, and Team USA did not do the same at all. There is no defensive 3 second violation in FIBA, so you can quite literally camp in the paint. Yet you rarely saw anyone on Team USA take advantage of it. They were getting annihilated in the paint basically every single game. People were screaming about Austin Reeves getting bullied in the paint against Germany, but where was the help? Why was there not someone sitting in the paint the entire game like every other team was doing? Their defensive scheme just made no sense from a game plan standpoint and they heavily relied on players just being athletic. I really have no idea what the coaches were thinking during all this. Several spectators like me were calling this out from the very beginning so I don't get how a group of Hall of Fame coaches didn't fix it in 10 plus games. Packing the paint and forcing teams to shoot is like the biggest difference between FIBA and the NBA so I don't get how nobody realized that. However, the game against Canada was basically an NBA game. Nobody had a super tall lineup and nobody was really packing the paint the entire game. So them losing to a clearly inferior Canada team was definitely the most embarrassing loss by far. Shout out to Canada though for literally making history. I said in one of my videos before that they're playing for a top 3 finish and not necessarily the gold, so that's a major win for them. However, for Team USA, their offense wasn't much better than their defense. They didn't have very many sets and were mostly just running ISO or a high ball screen. Which is what most Team USA teams have done in the past, but as you can tell it's starting to not really work. Some of these other teams' offenses put Team USA's to shame. I get Team USA doesn't play all year round like some of these other teams do, but they still had a long time where they at least could have built something. Anthony Edwards became the main guy, but mostly because he was looking to score every time he got the ball. Which isn't a bad thing, if anything the team needed it, but it's not like they were going out of their way to run a bunch of plays for him. He finished by far with the most points per game on the team, but it also led to some moments where he's trying to be the hero where the team could have done something else. Instead of actually trying to run some type of offense, the offense became give the ball to Edwards and see if he can create his own shot. Again, I'm not blaming him for it, I'm blaming the structure of the offense. Because opposing teams were packing the paint on defense and it was forcing Team USA to just take jumpers. Mainly because it's either drive to the paint and bang with the bigs or take an easy shot they want you to take. Just because it's an open shot doesn't mean it's the best shot. The team had shooters, but not nearly enough for the offensive style they were playing. Their half-court offense just wasn't the most efficient, and again, they heavily relied on their players to constantly make plays. A majority of their points were scored in transition. Anytime there was a fast break, the team pushed the ball like crazy trying to get a bucket before the defense sets back up. But I'm not trying to say this entire run was a complete failure either. There are still a lot of positives to take from this. First of all, the entire roster that went into this year's World Cup is super young. So the team you saw this year will most likely be the same team you see 4 years from now. And if we're being honest, for the most part they still played really good. Very few players on this team have even played an international game before this year's World Cup. So having this experience under their belt should help them improve a lot going forward. 
COVID also messed up the FIBA and Olympic cycle, so this will be the first time the World Cup and Olympics are played in back-to-back -back years. So a few players that typically would have played in the World Cup are saving themselves for next year's Olympics instead. An NBA season is already a lot of games, so adding more basketball two years in a row is kind of a lot to ask for. Especially for players coming off a deep playoff run, it's why you didn't see Jamal Murray play for Canada this year and it's the same reason why we went in with the roster we did. They built an extremely good two-way roster, everyone on the team can make an impact on both offense and defense, which was their biggest emphasis. And a lot of players start in their role perfectly. I'm gonna start off by completely skipping over the starters and mentioning the bench players, because most of them were showing up more consistently than the starters. I get it's more difficult to start the game than it is to come in halfway through the first quarter, but the bench never ever started slow. They got in the game and you felt their impact almost immediately. The starters really struggled to get going and dug themselves into a hole against several teams throughout the tournament. Austin Reeves played way better than anybody thought and proved a lot of his haters wrong. Tyrese Halliburton was one of my favorite players to watch because he is the least selfish player on the entire team. Coming off the bench with shooters like Austin Reeves and Cam Johnson, plus cutters like Paolo and Bobby Portis, it just worked perfectly. Even Walker Kessler played better than I thought he would and at times was more impactful than Jaron Jackson was. The bench wasn't perfect, but they all played really well. They were an extension of the starting lineup versus being a downgrade when they came in. The starting lineup though had times where they struggled a lot. Some games they flowed together perfectly, and other times they couldn't score or get a stop really at all. Brandon Ingram was essentially non-existent for the entire tournament. People thought he was going to take the role that Anthony Edwards did, but Ingram struggled a lot. I actually admire the fact that he recognized he was struggling and took that step back. He could have forced his shots up, but instead let other players take the lead, so I can at least respect that. Jalen Brunson ran the show pretty well and came out hot to start in a few different games. Same thing with Mikel Bridges, he didn't have the biggest role in the starting lineup, but was out there doing everything. He got rebounds on both offense and defense, while also being able to contribute offensively. I have mixed feelings about Jaron Jackson Jr. He was the team's only real rebounder and paint defender. There are other players on the team that can play good defense, but he was the tallest guy that needed to be there to guard the bigs. The only problem is most of the opposing teams had a lot of bigs, while Team USA didn't. So not only did Jaron have to step up and defend and out-rebound multiple centers, but there really wasn't anyone to replace him. Walker Kessler is a center, but doesn't have the paint presence that Jaron does. But other than that, there really was nobody that could replace him, so his play suffered and the team felt it a lot. Jaron could have played better, but they also could have picked up another big or came with a better game plan. The team didn't have very many flaws, but the ones they did have got exposed. After the exhibition games, I really did think they were going to win the whole thing. I thought there was no way that this roster and coaching staff loses to anybody, but that first exhibition game against Germany really was the beginning of their downfall. They had a bunch of blowouts after, but Germany had them figured out and couldn't wait to play them again. And because Team USA came in 4th place, the Olympic team is definitely going to want to avenge that. Even LeBron said he's going to play, so I truly cannot imagine what that roster is going to look like. I don't know if it's going to be better than that Redeem team roster, but it's definitely going to be up there. It does suck that Team USA came in 4th place, but sometimes that's just how it goes. Let me know down in the comments how you felt about this Team USA roster and where you think they went wrong. Leave a like on the video for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to the channel, it means more than you think.